So, uh, our first speaker is Arthur Nussbaum, originally of um, Detroit, Michigan, now of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, a very knowledgeable person, dealer, collector, um, archivist, uh, he's done some original research, doing valuable work, um, publisher of these fine catalogues. Uh, he also has a website, so please uh, do contact Arthur afterwards. There are also cards on the table which you can take. Um, Arthur is uh, an expert in big literature, especially William Burroughs. And it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Arthur. Little of Ansacher Wilkin, a member of Tennessee Williams Circle. Bowles 
of Hurley, who were both close to Williams and must have met Lilith from him. There are further references to her in the letters, deepening her enigma. I found very little about her, even in the recent doorstop of biography of Williams by John Lahr, which just mentions her in passing. Thirdly, there is Bowles' evocation of the Moroccan milieu. The passage I quoted exemplifies his artful, reflective description as a keen observer and in his fashion and distance. This mixture of understanding, interpretation, and wit, with alienation and even hostility, is developed through the letters as in his novels and stories. The next letter from Bowles, dated October 11, 1965, features the first reference to William S. Burroughs. Burroughs is in London, waiting, he says, for the rainy season to begin in Tangier before returning here. Perversity knows no bounds. Burroughs is to pass through in the midst of his quarter century as an expatriate, living and writing first in Mexico and other parts of Central and South America, then the first critical period in Tangier where he writes what will become a naked lunch, then Paris at the Beat Hotel, then Tangier again, then London, from where he sporadically returns to Tangier as he is about to, as noted by Bowles in this letter, Finally, back to the USA. Also introduced here is Alfred Chester, another underappreciated writer who flourished and burned out in the arc of the 60s decade, a bedeviled figure who died very young at the dawn of the 70s. Bowles writes, Alfred Chester can't remember what the world was like before he came here to Tangier. The place seems to have brought a full transformation in his case. I assume that is what he wanted. However, he is convinced that black magic has been used on him, and given the circumstances of his life, it seems quite likely. As you know, magic here means slow poisoning with drugs, as well as spells and trances. At the end of the letter, he handwrites, we've all come up against it at one time or another. Belief in Barack, Moroccan black magic was shared by the Bolses. Paul suspected it was being practiced on Jane by her inscrutable girlfriend, Sharifa, by Chester, to whom it fit neatly into his paranoia, by Brian Geisen, who blamed it for the failure of his restaurant, 1001 Nights, and many other Westerners. As far as drugs, of course, black magic was largely self-administered, especially in the case of Burroughs. In 1966, the first year that I have letters for both parties, the three themes I have noted are further developed, along with an intense dialogue on what being a writer means. In Bowles' letter of April 8, 1966, he expresses his and Burroughs' enthusiasm for Hermity's first two novels, All Fall Down and Midnight Cowboy. He describes Burroughs as ecstatic after reading Midnight Cowboy, and observes about both novels, what I admire beyond the style is the easy way in which both books capture the United States and its particular essence, without, however, expressing any opinion extrinsic to the story, without even a hint of disaffection. Wonderful. I suppose that strikes me because I've always been afraid to tackle America. I know quite well that my hatred would show through all defenses. Later in this letter, Bowles quotes Perrault as having told him, Keep a journal. It's the most useful thing you can do. This quote is the catalyst for a dialogue of the nature of writing, of journals, and in general. Bowles equates journal writing with making faces of oneself in the mirror, and claims never to have kept one, that if he did for himself it would be farcical, and if for publication, subject to self-censorship. The first letter from Hurley to Bowles in the collection, dated April 26, 1966, expands this dialogue at length over two cramped pages. He is searching and inconclusive, looking, I think, to the older Bowles for understanding, struggling with the topic and himself. Here are some key statements. I think humans have a powerful need to have their lives witnessed. This thing is especially big in writers. And I think perhaps as one gets older, more mature, one realizes more and more the value of being oneself publicly as well as privately. And with any kind of luck, the writer would reflect that, journal or otherwise. About Bowles commending of Midnight Cowboy as being non-judgmental yet revelatory in its depiction of the USA, early he writes, My own feelings about this country are a jumble and a mess. Hatred does not cover it. I'm torn between calling it affection and Order. In his letter of April 30th, 1966, Bowles arrived at this conclusion. In the end, we agree that whatever words one puts down under whatever circumstances are always meant for other eyes and other minds. And here is a key statement on Bowles' dark outlook on a writer's purpose and fate. Too much importance is given the writer and not enough to his work. What difference does it make who he is and what he feels, since he's merely a machine for transmission of ideas? In reality, he doesn't exist. He's a cipher, a blank, a spy sent into life by the forces of death. I am struck by the similarity of Bull's outlook with that of Burroughs, as I quote from the atrophied preface chapter of Naked Lunch. There's only one thing a writer can write about, what is in front of his senses at the moment of writing. I am a recording instrument. I do not presume to impose a story, plot, continuity. Insofar as I succeed in direct 
recording of certain areas of psychic process, I may have limited function. I am not an entertainer. In Hurley's short, rather swaggering letter of May 31st, 1966, he writes, I'm wildly stimulated by your remarks about the writer as spy, non-participant. I believe him. And I also see him as poor minor, wants to fuck everybody who reads him. Fuck, get in there and do something that makes a difference to the reader. We like to say the phallus we use is truth, but we're desperate to participate and we use nearly any device to achieve an entrance. Again, I am struck by an echo of Burroughs with this concept of the word virus that infiltrates the reader and his attempts to subvert the pre-recorded pattern of the universe with the cut-ups and other methods. The letters continue with ever greater familiarity and friendship between the two dedicated writers, with Bowles addressing Hurley as Jane. More references to the elusive Lilla and Alfred Chester appear, as if they are side characters in an absurd comedy. Bowles mentions the French writers, Raymond Roussel and Jean-Paul Sartre, in the context of his ongoing dialogue with Hurley on the nature of writing. Bowles refers to his breathless travels in Tangier, to Thailand and elsewhere, and to his translation of A Life Full of Holes by his friend, Ben Hamid, Chris Ben Hamid Charhadi, whom he calls Larvi. There were attempts by Hurley to meet Bowles in person, but they seemed to have missed each other. In his letter of November 25th, 1966, Bowles first refers briefly to Brian Dyson. I take it you didn't meet Brian Dyson while you were there, in Tantra, that is, while Bowles was in Thailand. In the same letter, Bowles proves himself to have been a proto-New Urbanist with this observation about Bangkok. In Bangkok, there is no place to walk. Pedestrians are considered a dying form of life, and all consideration goes to the mourners. If you were really a good man, you too would be a mourner, is understood beneath. In Bowles' last letter to Hurley during 1966, dated December 30th, there is this delightful passage. How do you manage to make your envelopes look as though they had come from some distant, exotic land? It's the stamps, of course, but I never recognize any of them and always take them for foreign ones at first. This time you got Alexander Hamilton, Einstein, Virgin Mary, and Franklin Roosevelt together. Sort of like Truman's plaza party. This, of course, is a witty reference to Truman Capote's black and white ball held at the Plaza Hotel in New York City only a month earlier, on November 28th, a legendary eclectic event known as the Party of the Century. Bowles was in touch with what his literary friend and occasional visitor to Tangier was up to in his loathed America. The amount of letters in the collection peaks in 1967, with 10 from Bowles and 3 from Hurley, and the remainder of the 60s decade is prolific at Bowles' end. Threads of ideas, works released and in progress, places and people continue, and we're introduced to more characters in their lives, including Mohammed Rabin, a Moroccan storyteller and artist closely associated with Bowles, <coughs> who translated his spoken stories into many volumes in English, beginning in 1967 with Love with a Few Hairs. Bowles and Hurley's ultimately unsuccessful attempts to have a film made based on this work are described in many of the letters. Bowles came to understand the challenges presented to a native writer by a free state monarchy under the reign of King Hassan II through his closeness with Rabet in life and work. Jenny Bowles, Paul's brilliant but benighted wife, with whom he shared an open marriage as they both pursued same-sex relationships. Bowles' letters depict Jane's horrendous decline into mental and physical wreckage as he shovels her back and forth between hospitals in Spain and their home in Tangier. In a cursive manuscript letter dated June 27, 1968, he writes, Sitting in the psychiatrist's office, waiting for him to arrive to discuss Jane with him. I'm thinking of taking her up to Granada for a few weeks, where it will be cooler. Malaga does not have an ideal summer climate. There is an American anthropologist up there whose wife has opened a pension. However, I must first discuss the project with her doctor. Then I must visit the place myself and decide whether or not it's feasible for her. Then I must return here, and if it is, go again, taking her along. Should the place be counter indicated, I shall have run out of ideas for solutions to the immediate problem, as I can't let her go back to Tangier at this point. Half measures are generally more complex than extremes. When a person is well enough to leave the hospital and yet not ready to go home, it can get difficult. I'm hoping to solve it in a few days and be in Tangier by next week. In a letter dated July 24, 1968, Bowles drolly describes his and Morabe's tribulations trying to cope with Jane. I've been a good deal in Spain trying to get Jane settled somewhere. Last month I took her out of the hospital and up to Granada to stay with some friends who have a house in the Albison, looking out on the Alhambra and the general life. However, although she picked up a bit there, they found they could not cope with her, which did not surprise me, and telephoned almost immediately asking me to go back and get her. Complications. I took Barabbas with me that time and we got a Hertz Fiat and accomplished the maneuver quickly, 
not without a ghastly scene with the friends in Granada, a scene into which Morava had entered with such verve that the friends were locking themselves in the bathrooms to escape his wrath, being expressed by waving a 7th century Riffian cleaver at their necks. It was part of an arms collection affixed to the wall. I was accused by them of systematically destroying Jane's mind, and also of planning to exterminate her when conditions were propitious. Fortunately, I found a Clinica de Reposo near Malaga that had a vacancy and was lucky and quick enough to get her in there the following day. I realized that none of this account could make sense, nor did it at the time, save that the friends were roaring drunk night and day. However, motivations were harder to come by. I finally settled for feminine intentions, two sisters and the husband of one. The husband remained strictly outside the Belize, having retired to the top floor to write and sleep. Tennessee Williams, a friend of both writers, is asked after in Bowles' handwritten letter of June 27, 1968. And where is Tennessee, and what is he doing? Was it you, Hurley, who told me that he falls down frequently? Someone wrote me that bit of news recently, but I hear from several friends about him now and then. Is it likely that he'll get hold of himself, do you think? The great American writers James Purdy and Carson McCullers are brought up by Bowles in a letter dated September 4th, 1967. About Purdy, he writes, a letter today from James Purdy makes me feel he is not in a very good way. He feels Eustace Chisholm was a failure, and he adds that the reason is that he is not Jewish, or a Negro, or a taker of LSD. What can you gather from all that? The next sentence reads, this whole country, the USA, is a dry pool of shit. Is it a non sequitur or something graver? Strange man. Then about the colors, Holes writes, I was sad to hear about Carson, her life has been worse than James. The colors died later the very month this letter was written. Early he must have informed Bowles of her grave illness. In the last of three letters written closely in time during August and September 1967, Early responds to Bowles' inquiry about Purdy on September 16th. I think I can shed some light on his, Purdy's, attributing his failure to the fact that he's neither Jewish nor Negro nor taker of LSD. You may remember that a few years ago, late 40s, early 50s, Certain ball clanking types were claiming that the homosexuals had taken over the literary scene at seven. Well, all that's been reversed. The takeover is allegedly being done now by the New York suburban intellectual Jew, Roth, Solinger, Bruce Friedman, etc. And it sounds as if Jim Purdy has fallen into the power. I don't quite know how he gets the Negro in there, with two or three exceptions, they are having pretty slim pickings, I'd say. As for LSD users, they're not selling books, others are selling books about them. In a letter Bowles wrote from Marrakesh, dated April 7, 1968, the interaction among members of the literary and jet set is described in this passage. Targwiski suddenly appeared today, here from Tangier, looking for Brian Geiser, who is at the Paul Getty Palace. I had to take him around to show him where it was, and he's been with us ever since. Brian and the Gettys and Yves Saint Laurent have gone for the day to Assori. Now Brian's back, very burned. I just saw him at the Café de Glacier. Madame Tanus Tazi was staying with the Gettys, told of the Sultan's apoplexy when a light full of holes is mentioned in conversation. Immediate rage, not so encouraging. Two major figures of 20th century culture and counterculture and literature casually appear in this short letter from Bowles dated October 15, 1969. Haven't heard from you early in a good while. I suppose you're busy. Nothing much happens here, can't hear. Timothy Leary was here for a month or so in the summer and said he'd be returning in November when he gets his business in court straightened out. Jean Genet has been here now for about three weeks, staying at the Minza, but nobody sees him if he can help it. He can't always help it. The number of letters in the collection tapers off during the 1970s, and the gaps in correspondence between the writers' wives. Among the letters of the 1970s, two written by Hurley close in time during December 1973 and January 1974 are of special interest. Overwritten directly to Murabe in response to four questions Murabe posed to Early and several other writers, including Tennessee Williams and the novelist, screenwriter, and Hollywood biographer Gavin Lambert. According to Bowles in a letter dated September 19, 1976, Williams and Lambert never replied to Murabe, but others did, including Early. In Early's first letter, he declares Murabe's fourth question is favored and answers it first, followed by the rest in reverse order. I will focus on questions four and three. The fourth question is, what did I, early, do all day when I was five years old? He then launches into a lengthy remembrance of his life as a five-year-old in Depression Era, Ohio, circa 1932. It is too long to quote entirely here, I wish I could, and is so evocative. The first sentence portends Hurley's career. When I was five, my life changed because I began to learn to read and write. After describing grown-up women who captivated him, he writes, 
I was also in love with a woman named Romaine's brother Woody, who lived on an apple farm outside of town. He looked like the cowboy star Bob Steele. Having read two of his great novels, I can't help but wonder if this early memory was a source for a main character in All Fall Down, the narrator's older, ne'er-do-well brother, who occupies a gone-to-see apple orchard outside of Cleveland, where he operates a brothel. And of course, the reference to a cowboy figure brings to mind the protagonist of Midnight Cowboy. Early Eden next answers Robin's third question, asking for straightforward advice on what to do to be a writer. I would say, begin. Go at once and get some paper and a pencil and sit down and start right now. And if there is any reason at all for which you are unable to do so, then put the idea out of your mind forever. Never think about it again as long as you live. And if one day you find that the urge to write is so strong as to be uncontrollable, then forget all about my advice and do as you please. But don't become a hand-ridden fool like the rest of us. The last continuous correspondence between the writers consists of a letter from Bowles dated April 2nd, 1977. <coughs> On the two by early in and a letter dated April 15, 1977, which is the last by him in the collection, to which Bowles responds in a letter dated May 22, 1977. In Bowles' April 2nd uh, letter, he writes, Your letters about life in the States at this point are of the sort that make me profoundly thankful not to be there. Although you don't try to put over any particular impression, the actuality seems through, and it all sounds a good deal less than sheer delight. Again, the quality of Hurley's depiction of American life that Bowles and Burroughs admired is noted, and it is clear that Hurley's dispatches have reinforced Bowles' reference to stay far away from the land of his birth and early life, even though his essential alienation and dispassion is always with him in Tangier and wherever he goes. The legendary writer and diarist Anais Nin is dryly noted in this same letter. Sorry, Anais, he died. I never really knew her, but she was there. Anais Ned died in January 1977, less than three months earlier. Early had known her in his early life. She was his writerly mentor, and they probably had an affair. Typically, Bowles writes about many projects, including novels, stories, his autobiography, translations, and helping with the biography of Jane, who had died four years earlier. But in a way, it's if he's not really doing anything or of any significance. Meanwhile, he's concerned about Early's lack of output. I'm rather astonished that you haven't written anything since Wish, nothing at all, or just no novel. Of course, my last novel was far longer than seven years. I merely imagine my case was unique. Of course, one always tends to think one is that, and one is always wrong. The Witch is Season of the Witch, early his third and last novel, published in 1971. After further feeding Bowles aversion to America with descriptions of its mid-70s malaise, early he responds about writing in his April 15, 1977 letter. I think I used to write out of a kind of innocence that has long since been used up and haven't found where the new gas tank is located. Something of that sort. Thornton Wilder said to me when I visited him in 1975 that he thought the times were too turbulent to be dealt with in any way but the comic spirit. That rang a lot of bells somehow. For instance, it seemed perfectly okay in 1964 to write Midnight Cowboy, but now that everybody surely has awakened to the sadness and horror of modern life, I have no impulse whatever to keep beating my ears over the head with it. Whereas if I could be visited by a comic spirit, well, I think that's at the crux of the matter. I'm no longer quite so willing to feel the turmoil of my characters. I want to write at some distance. Bowles responds in his letter of May 22nd, 1977. One, I don't think one can wish to be comic or try to be comic. It either comes out that way or it doesn't. I'm not sure I agree with Wilder, but if he's correct, why is there such a dearth of comedy today? Also, you say you want to spare the reader, but are you certain that he wants to be held at a distance? The final three letters in the collection are all from Bowles. One written on June 21st, 1979, and two on July 26th and August 27th, 1984. In his letter of July 26th, 1984, Bowles writes, I sympathize with you, early me, for the nausea that can overtake you when you sit down at the typewriter. I felt more or less the same thing for years, not exactly nausea, but utter disinclination. Fortunately for me, letter writing doesn't produce the same paralysis. So most of my writing is in the form of correspondence. One doesn't have to imagine a reader. Bowles goes on bitterly to disparage his life as a writer, insisting on its lack of monetary or other rewards. He is very discouraging, and as I read his work and about his life, I cannot quite believe him. The letters between these two great writers are so rich with descriptions, incidents, insights, and references. I hope I have given you a broad impression of their themes and moods. I will conclude with the reading of the second paragraph of the last letter in the collection, written by Bowles from Tangier on August 27, 1984. 
I think it evokes the flavor of his published writings and echoes those of Hurley, Burroughs, Williams, and others in his circle of attraction, many of the greatest authors of the 20th century. <coughs> Our heat is now in the 70s and is accompanied by a constant breeze, so it's not only bearable but pleasurable. There are sheep everywhere from dawn to dusk being made to eat as much as possible in preparation for the sacrifice, which comes next week. The small boys climb into the trees and break off the branches. Then the animals below strip off the leaves. They also stand on their hind legs against the walls of the so-called villas and devour the flowering plants that hang over the edge. All this is in contrast to the magma of entrails, horns, hooves, and blood that fills the streets on the morning of the sacrifice. Thank you.